Well, it's good to be here with you this morning, and uh, wow, this is a huge group. Good for you for coming, and um, I know it's hard to pull yourself away from your school, and um, I'm sure you're regretting missing some school, but um, the Lord will help you with that in these days. So, uh, is anybody here from Illinois? Anybody here from Illinois? Okay, a couple, wow. All right. So, um, you know, we're there in the People's so Socialist Republic of Illinois, and uh, we had to make a run for the border, and uh, we made it across. They have machine gun turrets and uh, big walls, and um, so we got across just in time, and as they blew our windows out and our tires of our car, but, um, okay, now that's a joke. Okay, so, uh, so, so you're like, I've heard about Illinois. I didn't know it was that bad. So my family and I, uh, in about 2012, the Lord called us into this ministry, and it's, it is a unique ministry, and I think a lot of people are still trying to get their mind around, um, you know, the need for it and things like this, but if you're a young person, let me just say that um, the, thing, the things I'm seeing in our ministry, which is Purity Plan Ministries, okay, purityplan.org, um, generally speaking, I don't work with a lot of teenagers. Now, I was a, I was a youth pastor for, for many years, but in this ministry, I don't work with teenagers in the sense that, um, that they're coming for help. And the reason is because as a teenager, often when you struggle with sexual temptation and sexual sin, you might think that you don't really have a problem and that you know, if you just try a little harder, you'll be okay. And so what happens is you add about 20 years onto that mindset, and those are the people I'm dealing with. Because they finally realized, I'm in my 30s now, or my 40s, and in some cases, their marriage is totally destroyed. Never to be the same again, if it will ever even be a marriage again. I mean, we're talking about losing your family, losing everything. And if you don't start early in this matter of staying within the lines, it'll get out of control real fast in the matter of sexual temptation and sexual sin. And so I'm thrilled to be able to be here, and I really appreciate um, Brother Ramos and, and Pastor Dameron um, allowing me to come. But one thing is, I guess I wish that um, when I was your age, I would have heard a lot more preaching on this subject. And I think in our circles, what we tend to do is we do preach on it for young people, that, but then after you graduate from high school and stop going to camp or youth conferences, you almost never hear another message on sexual integrity and sexual purity again. Now you'll hear points, but you won't ever hear a, probably a whole message. And if you have, please talk to me afterwards. I would love to meet your pastor or the people who have been preaching to you those topics because it seems to just be something that we stay away from. We, um, we, we're not sure what to do with it uh, as a pastor, a youth pastor, um, even our parents, you know, as parents, they're afraid of the subject and it's awkward and everything like this. And the devil's like, hey, I'm good with that. As long as no one else touches it, there's no competition. There's, no, there's nobody giving truth, real truth, about the dangers and the damage and the duration of this thing. And so I'll just come in and just, I'll just take out the next generation. Watch me do it. And that's exactly what he's doing. In fact, there's not even a close second when it comes to people losing their ministry. Nobody would know what the second reason is if you were going to put some statistics together. Nobody would be able to figure out what is the number two reason men get out of the ministry. Nobody would know. There's no way to track it. But everybody knows. Where's Brother Ramos? Everybody knows he's been in ministry for a while. The number one thing that takes men out of ministry, sexual sin. So as long as we don't preach on it, the devil's good because he's going to decimate churches, families, lives, futures, kill revival. 
And um, as the world increasingly gets worse and Christians increasingly don't know what to do or don't do anything about it, then um, we're, we're going to see the end come and we're going to have a lot more problems ahead. So I kind of start out with a negative, uh, but this is because of the serious subject. Um, open your Bibles, if you would, please, to Judges chapter 16. And while you're turning there, I just want to say we will have a table set up uh, in the other building um, that, that will probably be set up by the end of the next your major session coming up. Um, but just to point out a couple things about um, some things you might want to go by and check out at the table. All right? How many of you have ever struggled with having consistent and quality devotions in the Word of God? Can you raise your hand? Okay. If you didn't raise your hand, it's not, it's not like you're a bad person. You probably just were wondering, should I raise my hand or not? Will I get in trouble if I raise my hand? Um, throughout your whole life, you're actually going to have a challenge when it comes to having quality and godly and, uh, and helpful devotions. Probably throughout your whole life. It's not something that the Bible talks about. These things are spiritually discerned. So you actually have to be in a certain mindset, in a certain heart frame of mind, heart set, to, um, to get things out of the Bible. You can read, and you can go to church and just be in the flesh, and you can hear it all and have it up here, but for it to really have the impact that will change your life, it's spiritually discerned, the Bible says. Okay? You, have to, you have to, only God can open your heart to it, and the Spirit has to lead you into the truth. So often teenagers struggle with um, having good devotion. So we have a, a book on the table, you can check it out. Um, and it's called Renew Your Mind, and it's a two-year devotional Bible study. This is just... It's year one. It comes in two volumes. And I've had um, put about a thousand hours, over a thousand hours into these two volumes to starting with to help our church years ago. And then it developed into something that people are using all over the place. If it can help you, go check it out. The reason I would tell you about that is because if you go by the table, don't just think, well, I don't struggle with sexual purity, so I don't even need to go there. Okay. Realize, oh, man, let me go see if there's something that, you know, would help me in my Bible reading or something like that. Another book we have is this one. This is for young ladies called Before You Meet Prince Charming. Have any of you heard about this? Okay, so like seven people. Um, obviously, it's a bestseller. Um, and I didn't write this. This is written by a young, a young lady who was probably in her 20s um, by the time she got married. Um, so she had a long time where she um, did not know who she was going to marry. And um, she wrote this delightful book called Before You, Before you Meet Prince Charming, and um, A Guide to Radiant Purity. And I would encourage you young ladies to come by and look at this. And if you don't, um, if you don't already have it, maybe take a look at it. And then this, which many of you have heard of, Stay in the Castle. Um, now, there, of course, there are four of these. I don't know if you know, but um, this is the one that's been around for 20 years. And then a couple years ago, Pastor Ross um, wrote three more. So it's amazing. So if you haven't heard the rest of the story, of stay in the castle, there's more to it, and it's amazing. So um, I think the bookstore may have these here, but if you can just buy them off our table instead of the bookstore, I'd appreciate that. <laughs> okay. They get really rich over at that bookstore. I know how that works. So it's a money cash machine, right? A cow cash. So, all right, cash cow. Judges chapter 16. So do you know what Judges chapter 16, who this is about? Yeah, so it's about Samson, and this is a, a well-known story, and this is one of these stories that you would know so well, you could tell it to me. But God has led us to this passage, and I just want to encourage you that this, I guess I thought of this this morning, it, it, it's sad, I think if Samson knew, it's sad that for all eternity, as long as people are preaching from the Bible, so for all of time, his life is going to be used as a bad illustration. Now, everything we know about Samson happens in four chapters. Everything. So nothing we know about this man, we don't know anything before about, I think, chapter uh, 13. 
and uh, chapter 12 is about his, his parents, and 13, anyway, 14, 15, 16. At the end of chapter 16, which we're in the last chapter of his life, um, this is all we, all we know about him. So he comes up and goes down everything about him in four chapters. And it all revolves, for the most part, his life, very clear the, the message God is trying to communicate through his life. Do you realize there's a lot of things in Bible characters' lives that we don't know? We don't know much about any of them. We know a few things about, in, about some of them. We don't know the daily things they did for the most part. We, we know the eventful things, the consequential things, the ones the Lord wanted us to know. We know about Queen Esther. We don't know anything much about her life beforehand, but then we know as she comes to the throne and then she makes a big decision to, if I perish, I perish, and, and, and we know that. Samson, we know about his parents, we know about his hair, we know about that if he cuts his hair, you know, we know the whole thing, but we don't really know much about him. We just hear little, we just see little glimpses. We don't even know how old he is, but he is, we'll say, in his 20s. And what's interesting is he was raised in about the same time as Samuel. And whereas Samuel, later on, becomes obviously a great man, Samson just flames out. And we want to look at here for a few minutes how sin and sexual pleasure ruins the Christian. Okay, so you got, your, you got those notes on, in, your, in your book there. Why don't you maybe jump, grab, grab those out and I'll give you three points here in a minute and then about 17 other points before I get to my three. Uh, Brother Ramos said we can go till about 12.30, so I hope you're ready to do that, and hopefully you got something to drink before you came in here. All right, let's look at this. Verse number one, Judges chapter 16, we'll actually start in verse number four. Judges 16, verse number four, and again, if you can take notes, I think this will be a, a big help. It shows the Lord and others that you're interested in, in, in retaining some of what you're getting here this week. And it came to pass afterwards, 16.4, came to pass afterward that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. And the lords of the Philistines came up unto her and said unto her, Entice him and see wherein his great strength lieth, and by what means we may prevail against him, that we may bind him to afflict him, and we will give thee every one of us 1,100 pieces of silver. And Delilah said to Samson, so, there's, so she's told this, she agrees to it, and so verse number six, we don't know how much time has passed between verse five and six, but apparently he comes visiting again and he comes and at some point they're just, you know, sitting out, you know, in the back uh, porch somewhere. And she says to him this, tell me, I pray thee, wherein thy great strength lieth and wherewith thou mightest be bound to afflict thee. And Samson said unto her, now this is not true but this kind of gives, tells us where he's at spiritually. By the way, let me just say this too before we read this verse. Samson was not a nobody. He actually was a judge. Is that true? He was a judge. And he judged Israel for 20 years. So it actually would put, to make him be a little bit older there. 20 years he was a judge. We're talking about there's some amazing judges throughout, throughout the Bible, and, and he's one of them. So this is not just somebody who knew nothing, and we just kind of hear about this obscure person. This is a person that, that God had set up to be kind of ruling spiritually when there were no kings. But here he is playing around with things, and he says to her, to kind of get this game started, if they bind me with seven green withs that were never dried, then shall I be weak and be as another man. Then the lords of the Philistines brought up to her seven green withs, which had not been dried, and she bound him with them. So this is like a vine. This is, if you study it out, they say this might be like you would use to uh, a bowstring, something small. And, she, and he says, if they'll tie me with seven of these these green or moist with, then that's what's going to happen. I'll just, it's somehow my magic, you know, this magic strength, this powerful strength is going to go. And so they're like, eh, okay, let's try that. So verse number, verse number nine, now there were men lying in wait 
abiding with her in the chamber, and she said unto them, The Philistine be upon thee, Samson. And he brake the withs, as a thread of tow is broken when it touches the fire. So his strength was not known. And Delilah said unto Samson, Behold, thou hast mocked me, and told me lies. Now tell me, I pray thee, wherewith thou mightest be bound. And he said to her, If they bind me fast with new ropes that never were occupied, then shall I be weak and be as another man. So now he says, if they, if they get these ropes, these are going to be bigger ropes that were never, ever made, done, had, had nothing done with them before. They've never been used you know, on the farm or uh, with plowing with cattle. These are, these are new ropes that never were occupied. So there's, the integrity is still there. You know, there's no way they'll frazzle. You know, if you do that, that's going to do it. Okay? And she says in verse 12, Delilah therefore took the ropes and bound him therewith and said unto him, The Philistine be upon thee, Samson, there were liars in wait, abiding in the chamber, and he brake them from off his arms like a thread. Delilah said unto Samson, Hitherto thou hast mocked me and told me lies. Tell me wherewith thou mightest be bound. He said unto her, So now he's thinking, and he says this, he's got to do something else because the rope thing is kind of, you know, maybe he's used that too much. So he says, If thou weavest the seven locks of my head with the web. So it appears to be that in her house she had something, as best I can figure out, like a weaver's loom that you would make garments on. And if you've ever been to a, a, a place that has old things like this, these big, these big machines that they would use to, um, to make thread and to uh, run the thread into garments and things like this. And he looks over and maybe sees that in the corner and he thinks, well, try this, because I'm not going to tell her, so might as well just... You know, every time she's asking me these questions, it's really cool because it's like strengthening our relationship because I really like this girl and, and uh, she's asking questions about my strength, so it's pretty awesome. So I'll just string her along here and um, we'll just keep doing this and doing this. And he says, you know what, um, here's what'll happen. If somehow you kind of put my hair through that. Kind of a strange thing, isn't it? But she goes for it. And it says, she fastened it with the pin, verse 14, and said to him, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awakened out of his sleep and went away with the pin of the beam and with the web. So the whole thing, he just like, you know, pulls it out of the wall or whatever. And she said unto him, How canst thou say, I love thee, when thy heart is not with me? Thou hast mocked me these three times, and hast not told me where when thy great strength lieth. And it came to pass when she pressed him daily with her words and urged him so that his soul was vexed unto death. Then he told her all his heart and said unto her, Thou hast not come a razor upon mine head. So now here it comes. For I have been a Nazarite unto God from my mother's womb. If I be shaven, then my strength will go from me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. And when Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called her, uh, for the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up this once, for he has showed me all his heart. Then the lords of the Philistines came up unto her and, of course, brought money in their hand, which is why she was doing this. And she made him sleep upon her knees, and she called for a man, and, and she caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head, and she began to afflict him, and his strength went from him. And she said, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he woke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself. In other words, it's going to be no, it's almost like shaking. This is like no problem for me. And he wist not or knew not the Lord was departed from him. But the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with fetters of brass and he did grind in the prison house. How many of you know how the story ends? Can you raise your hand? Does it end where he eventually, he, um, the Lord heals him of his blindness and his hair kind of grows back and, and um, some people come and rescue him and they bring you back to Israel and, uh, and they say, man, we thought we lost you. But, uh, and he's like, I know, that was, that was so bad. I should not have done that, but, um, but I'm back now and now I can get back to serving the Lord. Is that how the story ends? No. Does he break free from the Philistines? And even though he doesn't have his eyesight, he, he gives himself a seeing eye dog so he can go into the mall and the elevators. And, um, so then he rules over Israel for 40 more years, even though he can't see, but he does a good job because he knows a lot. Is that how it ends? No. He never gets to do any of that again. In fact, not only does he lose his freedom, 
but he loses his ability to get back into God's will. He can't ever get back into God's will because the, the way the things change. Now, he can get right with God, but he can't get back to what God had for him. There's no more chapters. It's done in about 15 verses. So what brought him down? Because he gets to the place where he can't do God's will and he can't even do his own will. He's, he's, everything's taken away from him. And this is, young people, this is what sexual sin will do. It's the only sin in the Bible that says because of this sin, a man is brought to a piece of bread. It's the only sin. It's the only sin in the Bible of which it is said, that's, from, that's Proverbs chapter 6, it's the only sin in the Bible of which it is said that if you do this sin, you are sinning against your own body. It's the only sin that it's said that about. So even the Bible treats sexual sin differently and and. I just know that God's going to have to raise more people up. And if you have a testimony of God freeing you from sexual sin, I'd be glad to know it because it needs to be trumpeted because this is the tool the devil is using these days. Because sexual sin is unlike any other, it does more damage, it causes more grief, destroys so many lives. But you don't have to be the next Samson. So... He gets caught up with Delilah and he doesn't get to do God's will for him anymore. So how does this happen? Well, if we would want to picture this, how this happens, this is a great illustration of how the devil still works. You realize the devil doesn't have to try anything new on you. He'd just do the same thing as long as he can get away with it, right? So some of you, he's going to try to take you down the, the path that Samson went. And you just got to make sure I'm not going to be the next Samson. Now, if you're, if you're a, um, a young lady here, the same thing can happen to young ladies. Now, this is from the, the life of a, of a man, but just flip it around and realize you can mess up just like this, right? So it's just an illustration of a guy who did it, but it's no different for a, 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 how a young lady can mess herself up. So what are the three things that will bring a person to where they lose it all in this matter of sinful pleasure and sexual pleasure. How does sin get you to a place where you're in bondage? You know, it's, it's quite true that sin can start as a curiosity, but then it will move to a habit, and then it will move to an obsession, and then it will move to bondage. So where are you at? Have you been playing around in the, a forbidden field of sexual temptation? And some of you say, yeah, it's been a while, and I'll try to stop, though, and if they give invitations this week, that likely will be one I talk to the Lord about because I always am talking to the Lord about that because it's a big struggle, big weakness on my part. Okay? Well, where are you at? Curiosity? Habit? Obsession? In other words, you can't get it off your mind even when other things are on your mind. You're here at the youth conference and you can't get this stuff off your mind. You're struggling even while you're here. Bondage. So what are the three things that allows sin to take hold in a person's life? Well, here it is. Number one, this is how it works. Number one, sin approaches you attractively. Can you write that down? Sin approaches you attractively. And we're going to move right along here. But it approaches you through your desires. You can put that word there alongside of the word attractively. You can say that it's through my desires. So this is the way Satan gets us. This is the way he'll take us down the Samson road to destruction. By sin and temptation approaching you attractively. So what happens is the way you get ruined is attractiveness wins out. Okay, so it's this thing that is to you desirable, it's a thing to you that is um, maybe exciting and pleasurable, exhilarating perhaps. You know, if you're a young lady and, you know, that, that boy just makes you feel so good. If you're a young man and you're just like, 
you know, I just feel so good when, and it's not right, but it, 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 it does feel good to, to be thinking these things. The idea of desirable definition is it describes something that appears to be worth having as being useful or pleasing. So the point is that temptation has a power, but here's the power, and you can ask your youth pastor about this later, or your pastor or some godly person. Does temptation have a power in and of itself? Well, here's what I think. I think temptation has a power, but the power comes because it's attractive to you. The power is in the attraction by which you are drawn to this. And sometimes, in, with this matter, other people don't even struggle with this matter. And perhaps you are strongly pulled to that way. Now, how come they don't struggle if temptation has its own power? No, temptation finds its power in the weakness of your desires. So what Satan is going to exploit in your life is do you have desires that are not going to stay in line and within the lines of God's will? So we will all have desires. The difference between ruin and God's blessing is that a person who will walk down the Samson Road of Destruction will let pleasure be the thing that rules. What they think is pleasing, what they think is desirable, what they think is worth having, they'll go. And, and the devil like, aha. Uh -huh. so, you know, the, the Bible says, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole world, seeking to show himself strong on the behalf of those whose heart is perfect toward him. So the Lord is looking to show himself strong in people's hearts. The devil is looking for people who aren't going to look to the Lord for help in the battle and who are just going to give in to what feels good and what they want to do and how they want to do it. So sin approaches you through your desires or attractively. The allure is the fact that it stirs something up in you. So the temptation somehow finds something in you and you're like, I like that. Now for you, it may not be sexual sin. It may be something else. It may be pride that is stirred because you want people to think well of you, and so you use you know, your ability to sing or uh, play the instrument or your Bible knowledge or your preaching ability or you, know, you were born with a physique that you think everybody just totally admires. Even the doctor, when you are first born, they said, wow, now that's a man right there, okay? <laughs> and you weren't very cognizant to hear it, but you're sure it was said, okay? Because you are amazing, aren't you? You are, right? How many say, I don't want to admit I'm amazing, but I will say who's not amazing is this guy next to me. Anybody want to say that? Okay, yeah, I get it. So, the, the pleasure principle is what took Samson out. Now, what was his hang-up? What was he weak in? Well, his weakness was women. So let me ask you, men, is your weakness, you're going to have a desire for the opposite gender, but is your weakness such that you just can't keep your mind where it needs to be. Young ladies, you're going to have a desire for the opposite gender, but are you giving in to something that right now is outside of God's boundaries for you? And nobody escapes from this. Nobody is not going to be tempted in this area. Get that? So if you've got a, a little bit of a problem or a big problem, realize, well, I'm not, there's nothing maybe wrong with me, and I can fix that this week by God's help. But maybe God brought me all this way. I mean, I had to scale this huge wall to get out of Illinois. I told you that, right? The machine guns were going off. My wife had to throw some grenades at the tower of the guards, and we broke through, and we came back in later and rescued her from an airplane. It was amazing, okay? But we came all this way to preach this message, and you may never hear another message like this again, and maybe God brought me here for, for you. And the other couple hundred teenagers are going to hear it, and it'll be like, helpful, hopefully, and you, this is going to save your life. Amen. And what it comes down to is if you've given in to this, it's you're just giving in to an attraction, and sexual things are attractive, aren't they? Particularly secret sexual things. Proverbs 9.17 says, she says to the young man, stolen waters 
are sweet and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. There's something about secret sexual sin that the devil uses over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. And it doesn't have to happen to you. But Satan will use a weakness in our desires to destroy us. Can you write that down? Satan will use a weakness in your desires to destroy you. And you'll be tempted with desires that are not to be fulfilled for now, and you cannot allow them to grow in your heart, and you will be tempted to rebel to get to do them. Now, I wonder if I'm already speaking to somebody. There is a pleasure principle, there is temptation that is taking root in your heart, and you can't fulfill it for now, but you are tempted to rebel to get it, or you are rebelling to get it. And it doesn't have to be just about sexual things. It could be about anything. Remember, these things, the, the devil is, is, if you think I'm too narrow here and you're thinking, well, that's not my problem, okay? Realize that this is a major problem. This is a major problem. But if, it, if it's, this is not your thing, the devil's still going to use pleasure to pull you out of God's will and a weakness in your desire, desires to destroy something that God has for you and you'll be tempted to rebel to get it. So what is attractive to you? Let me just ask you. So sin follows the path of our desires, that which is attractive to us. It approaches us attractively. So you can't be tempted, really, by something that's not attractive to you. You can't be tempted by something you don't like. Think about that. I don't like mushrooms at all. I hate mushrooms. And if my wife tries to get me to eat mushrooms, it's not going to be pretty. But you can't tempt me with mushrooms. You can't say afterwards, seriously, this young man can't come to me and say, hey. And while I'm standing there, he takes off the lid and he rubs underneath my nose. Okay? There's nothing to be like, oh no, please, 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 go away, go away from me. I'm going to say, you're, you're a freak. Get out of my face. <laughs> you can't be tempted with something that you don't like. So what do you like? What do you want? What's pleasurable to you? Is it being the prettiest girl in your youth group? Is it being the best basketball player in your school? Is it being the one that always gets the best grades? Pretty much always. Is the one who's the best on the piano. What is your thing that Satan's going to say? Now that's attractive. Go that direction. Is your weakness in your desire to all the things it could be? Is it to be approved by your friends? I will say, in all the years I was a youth pastor, I would take surveys of our kids. I was kind of a survey guy. I would take these surveys and ask them anonymously, often about you know, how you're doing in your Bible reading or how you're doing on you know, this or th different things. Just get some feedback from them. And, do you know when I would ask them the number one thing they struggle with? Over the years, we're talking 20 years. There was never not a time when the number one thing was not peer pressure. Acceptance by my friends. Wanting to be part of the gang I want to be a part of. And as long as that's going to be the attractive thing to you, then Satan has seen that for generations and for thousands of years. He knows exactly what to do. He'll bring along a friend. Amnon had a friend. Girlfriend or boyfriend, or just a friend. So ask this question, answer this question if you would. Life would be better for me, put yourself in the me, life would be better for me if, what? What would you put? Life would be better for me if only, 
And the thing that you would put in there, if only the, my parents would leave me alone, or if only I could, you know, move here, or leave, you know, change schools, or if I didn't have my little stupid brother. Whatever you put in there, the devil's going to say, this is how it works. This is the first step. You say, how do we know it's the first step? Well, this is what the Bible says, James 1.14. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. The very first step of temptation is every man is drawn away of his own lust, which means desire. The whole point is, the way Satan's going to do it is he's going to come to you through the path of your desires. Tell me what you really desire and I'll tell you where Satan will come after you. You'll be easy prey for the devil if you let your desires get the upper hand in your life. Romans 6.12, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof. The word lust just means desire. Paul says, don't let sin reign in your mortal body. And he says it, that you're going to obey your body in the lust, the desires of your body. Second, 1 Peter 2.11, Dear beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust. What's the word lust mean? Desire. That's exactly what the word means. Look it up. Abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul. Galatians 5.16, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust, that evil desire of the flesh. Number two, we'll move through this. Not only does sin approach you attractively, sin engages you deceitfully. Sin engages you deceitfully. And we won't read it, but you know from verses 6 through 14 what goes on, that Samson does not know what's going on, and Delilah does, and she's deceiving him. Is that true? And the bulk of this story, if you just try to measure it out in words and verses, the bulk of this story is around this point. The deceptions and the next point we're going to give here, about what happens in Samson's life. So he doesn't see it coming, but it comes. It's deceptive. Who is Delilah anyway? Who is she working for? Go ahead. Who is she working for? Yeah, she's not working for the Joe Biden camp. Okay, she's not working for, sorry. Um, you know, she's not working for Putin or whatever. All right? She's working for the Philistines. So the Philistines, are they the enemy? Yep, and Delilah's the enemy, isn't she? And the deception is, Samson does not know he's playing into the enemy's temptation here. He thinks maybe she's different. But if she's not different, I'm the strongest guy anybody knows, I'm okay. And I've got God in my life and all sort of stuff. You know, you can have God in your life and still really mess up that life. Is that true? That's what this message is about. Samson had more going for him in some ways than any of us have. I mean, he was ordained by God. You can read it. He, he was ordained by God before he was born. And here he is. And he's got this great strength. And it says the spirit of the Lord began to move on him. And the reason he was born, the Bible says in a previous chapter, was to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. To begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. And what he's doing is instead of delivering Israel out of the hand of the Philistines, he is embracing the Philistines. And he's so deceived. And sure, he wants to stop later. He, wants, he wishes it all would have stopped later. But the way sin works is it's deceptive, isn't it? Paul says, sin deceived me and by it that it slew me. So young person, it's very real right now, very real possibility that Satan has his eye on you. He does, doesn't he? 1 Peter 5, 8. He's looking. He doesn't care you're at this conference. He cares about what you do at this conference. He's watching you. And he's going to deceive you. And you're going to think that the thing you're involved in is not going to take you down a destructive road. And I don't even know what you're involved in, but I will say every teenager suffers from a universal problem, which is, and you're not at fault for this, but at some level you're spiritually immature. Is that true? 
It's not a knock. We have to grow in grace, don't we? We have to grow spiritually. We have to be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So we have to be strong. We have to learn to get strong. But that means that we're weak at some point. And the devil wants to pick off the weak ones. And for those who think they're strong, like Samson, he'll pick them off too. So whether you're actually immature or whether you actually are mature it does, uh, spiritually, it doesn't matter. But if you think you're mature and think that the little sins don't matter, I mean, Samson here is not doing anything. Um, I, I guess you could say he is committing adultery because earlier there was a problem with the harlot in verse number one. But he says in, in a previous chapter, he says, he tells his parents, I see this lady in Timnath, get her for me, for she pleases me well. Okay, he just comes out right and says, what is the motto of his life? I do what pleases me. Whereas Jesus says, I do always the things that please who? My father. So young person, where are you? Are you doing the things that please you, even if they're not disastrous right now? But they're not right. They're outside the line. We say, well, whose line? Your line. Why are you hiding it if you're not outside the line? I can't convict you. All I can do is preach the word of God, but the still small voice of God this week will come and talk to you. You know that? And when he talks to you, he's not talking about things about righteousness. He's talking about things that aren't righteous yet. And when he speaks to you, you're going to know that's that line. And before Tuesday, I never thought that was a line. I was just like, well, it's not that bad. My parents are just too strict. My church is just too strict. I'm okay, blah, blah, blah. And God's saying, no, that line actually is not for your parents. It's not for your pastor. That's for you. And Satan and Samson steps over the line because of deception. And thirdly, Sin involves you progressively. Sin involves you progressively. And this is the point maybe that you can get your mind around, but sin slowly gains ground and it entraps you through progressive involvement. In other words, incrementally. And here's how we know this is the way sin works because Samson keeps having these little episodes with her. You realize the whole thing is broken down. If, we're trying, if, you try, if you're going to be a Bible student, you're trying to say, well, what, what are we learning here? We're not just learning that sin will mess you up. We're learning how it messes you up. It goes down the line of your desires. Is that true? I mean, that's what it says. Get her for me. She pleased me well. Everything was about, in his case, the sexual or just about having companionship. We don't know exactly if Samson was in it for sexual things. We know he was in it for the opposite gender. Something about the opposite gender just did it for him. He wanted to have a girlfriend. And it may have been he might have just wanted to have a friend. But whatever it is, it ends up in the wrong place. So everything has to be brought under God's will and say, God, what do you want? What a, do you want me to have this friend? Do you want me to have, you know, what do you want? But because he didn't put God's will first, the next thing kicked in, which is the temptations of deceit, where he doesn't know that the ground is shifting underneath him. He doesn't realize he's further away from the shore than he thought he was. And how does that happen? Incrementally. So he says to Delilah, oh, you want to know how you get my strength? In other words, you want to know how you ruin me? <laughs> These women, they are not so bright these days. You get these little ropes and you tie them around me and I have seven locks in my hair, so you take seven widths and you tie them around me and, and I think that'll do it. And then he's like, rah, you know, the Incredible Hulk. And she's like, Samson, come on. So we're sitting at Dairy Queen talking and he says, um, you know what you do? You get these big ropes. You tie them around me and I just can't handle the big ropes. It's the, those little ropes. I don't know why you thought. I'm so, almost so much stronger than you thought I was, Delilah. Can I call you Dee Dee? <laughs> and uh, she says, yeah. So I'm going to go to Walmart and get these ropes, and um, I'll be back in a few minutes. That's cool. Comes back, falls asleep, she ties him up. Samson, Philistine's upon you. Rah! <laughs> this is so cool. 
So she says, Samson, now this is not right. We're not going back to Dairy Queen this time. We're going to Walmart Deli. In other words, the relationship's going down. <laughs> what are you going to do? How come you're not telling me what your strength is? I mean, we're friends, right? We're like lovers, right? And he says, okay, well, you got this weaving loom over there. So it's kind of weird, but like, if you like tie my hair into that thing, I know it sounds kind of weird, but that'll do it. And I won't break your machine. And Samson, if listen, be upon me, break. <laughs> so she's not happy now. And so she says, Samson, you know, now you've lied to me. The, the sad thing about this is that she's lying to him the whole time, right? She's accusing him of lying. The whole thing's a lie that she's doing. She's doing this to get rich. And progressively, the deception works. And he ends up saying, well, I wasn't going to tell you, but since maybe we're going to get married anyway, or we'll beat it, you know, we'll ride off into the future together. Here's what, since we're going to be together anyway, you're going to have to know at some point, if you cut my hair and make me look like a fundamentalist, <laughs> that <laughs> it's going to do it. And what happens is the sin takes hold because he allowed it to take hold. But then he gets to the point where he can't get out of the hold it's got on him. Young person with sexual sin, here's how it is. This is it. Listen, if you get nothing else, get this. Sexual sin escalates. And that's what's going to kill you. It starts with something minor, and there it goes. If you're into the minor right now, the only answer for you, the only answer, I'm telling you, I'm going to save your life right now. You have got to run two things. You've got to run to Jesus about this problem. I mean, run to Jesus. And the second thing is this. You have got to bring this thing into the light with somebody else. Satan will have your number for 25 years if you don't bring this into the light with somebody else. That means maybe your parents, maybe your pastor, ultimately somebody who's mature is going to have to help you. Not your friend Sally. She's probably got the same problem you got, dummy. If you say, let's make this pact, just you and me, and after youth conference, we're not going to do, you know, we're not going to mess around anymore. And it's like, what? We're not that strong. Our, our desires are the thing that get us in trouble, and now we just shifted our desire toward God. That's not going to hold. My desires are not trustworthy, are they? Someone's got to get a hold of me named Jesus. And he says, you've got to come to the light that your deeds will be shown that they are done in God. And as long as you keep stuff secret and try to solve it yourself so no one thinks you're messed up or got a problem, that's pride. And as long as you won't bring it into the light and humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and say, God, I'm doing this for you, but I heard what I have to do to stay out of the life of Samson's testimony, which is ruin, I've got to move away from the progression. I've got to move away from the deception. I've got to move away from my desires. I've got to find in Jesus. As we close here, can I just say no, 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 no decision you make this week will hold without you coming continually to Jesus for the strength you need to stay right. Can I get an amen on that? No decision. Listen, I've made a million decisions at youth conferences and youth camps, and I've preached a bunch on these things. You, no decision you make this week will hold unless that decision is where you realize, I am weak, but you are strong. Amen? Amen. And his strength is made perfect in your weakness. And if you'll run to the light and run to the cross and run to Jesus this week, he will meet you. And he will hold you. He's the chain breaker. He's the only one. And he's the only one that can go deep inside 
and make you begin to think there's hope and there's help in Jesus and there's a way out. And it's all because he has gone down this path before me. Samson went that way. Jesus went that way. And he's saying, give me your hand and we'll go. Young person, where are you at? If this message touched your heart, I pray that you'll let God speak to you about it. Let's pray together.